Hello and welcome to the tutorial CMAS and Advanced Adaptation Mechanisms. This tutorial has three main parts. First, we want to talk about the optimization problem or what makes optimization actually difficult. Then we talk about how a CMAS works and then we talk about how the user should use CMAS on a particular problem. Okay, let's start. What makes an optimization problem difficult to solve? And before we do that, we have to define our optimization problem in the first place. Our task is to minimize an objective function, also called fitness or loss function, in the continuous domain. So the search space is R to the n, and we have a function f which maps R to the n to R. We are on a black box scenario or direct search scenario. That means we can consider f to be a black box where we can throw solutions x at f and get the values of f of x, but we don't know what f specifically is. So we don't have necessarily gradients or gradients are not useful. And domain specific knowledge is only used within the black box. For example, we can have a particular encoding of the problem which we put into the black box to make the function easier to optimize. Then we also assume that the search costs are the number of function variations in general. Now the general goal is to converge fast to the global optimum or to find a solution x with a small function value as small as possible with the least amount of search costs, which, which is the least amount of function variations. Typical examples are shape optimization or model calibration or parameter calibration. Now the difficulty of continuous domain search is that exhaustive search is infeasible because the search space is too large. And for the same reason, naive random search takes usually way too long. Now we have deterministic search methods, but sometimes they are not successful. Sometimes they also take too long and in this case we look into other methods like evolutionary algorithms. Hi everyone, now Yohei Akimoto is speaking. Before we explain the CMAES, we introduce problem characteristics that appears commonly in simulation-based optimization. Understanding the problem difficulties is very important to also understand each component of the CMAS. Here we list the difficulties. The first one is the fact that we cannot assume the, the objective function have an analytically nice properties such as linear, quadratic, and convex. Therefore, the CMAS and many other evolutionary approaches are designed not to exploit such a nice assumption on the analytic form of the objective function. In other words, if we know that the objective function has such a property, the CMAS is probably not the best first choice, and much better such policy exploiting these properties are available. For the other difficulties, we will explain in the following slides. The next difficulty is lagness of the objective function. The lagness is caused by discontinuity or modality of the modes in the objective function. On such problems, local information of the objective function, such as the gradient, is often not useful. To tackle the lagness, one may need to gather more global information. For this purpose, Evolutionary strategies and many other evolutionary approaches use multiple solutions spread over the search space. The next one is dimensionality. The term cost of dimensionality is a well-known term referring to problems caused by the rapid increase in volume. 
For example, consider placing 20 points equally spaced on the interval from 0 to 1. Then from any point on the interval, we can find the placed point with the distance less than 0 0.05. Now consider the kin dimensional hypercube. To get the sim similar coverage, we need to place 20 to the power of 10 points. One remark about this point is that the distance measures break down in high dimensionalities. And one needs to be careful when designing a search algorithm using a distance measure. As a consequence of the curse of dimensionality, a search proceed that is variable in a relatively small dimensions, such as exhaustive search, might be not useful in high dimensional search spaces. Before describing the next difficulty, we introduce the definition of separability. A function is separable if the solution to the minimization problem of n variables consists of solutions to n single variable problems. An example of separable functions is an additively decomposable function like displayed at the bottom which is a sum of n single variable functions. If a function is separable, we can optimize it by optimizing n independent one-dimensional problems. Therefore, if we can assume the separability of the problem, we can avoid the cost of dimensionality. The next difficulty is the non-separability. So it is nice if we can exploit the separability of the problem as it can be a solution to the course of dimensionality. It is quite unlikely in the summation-based optimization that the problem is separable. Therefore, we need to deal with the non-separability in general. Non-separable problems can be easily constructed by rotating a separable function. This implies that even an essentially separable problem turns into a non-separable problem if we cannot select the right coordinate system. The left figure shows the landscape of the well-known Lastrigin function, and the right figure shows the landscape of its rotated version. On the left, the local minima are aligned in parallel to each coordinate, whereas on the right, it is not. Therefore, we cannot solve this problem by uh, decomposing into single variable problems, and we need to deal with the high dimensionality. Ill conditioned problems are those whose service sets have a high coverture. Let's consider a convex con quadratic function with the Hesse matrix H, which is a symmetric positive definite matrix. The level set of this function have ellipsoidal shape. If the condition number of the Hessian is relatively small, where the condition number of H refers to the ratio between the greatest and smallest eigenvalues of the Hessian. So if the condition number is small, relatively small, then the first order information is sufficient to solve the problem, like the gradient descent method works well on this function. On the other hand, if the condition number is higher, then we need second order information, as in the well known Newton method, to efficiently solve this problem. This is where the covariance matrix adaptation comes into play. The last difficulty is the non smooth level set. The difficulty of non smooth surface set is similar to ill, condition, Ill conditioning of the problems. However, it is usually worse than ill conditioning, especially if the opening angle at the corner of the level set is zero, like in the light most figure. The standard CMES fails to converge toward the optimum. 
and a special treatment is required. Therefore, we should avoid such an objective function if possible. I give a small summary of what makes a function difficult to solve and also the uh, possible approaches to tackle these difficulties. So one difficulty was dimensionality and related separability of the problem or non-separability. And the main approach here is to exploit the problem structure. If the function is separable, we can exploit separability. Otherwise, we would have to exploit locality or neighborhood. And this can also be done via encoding, but also via the search algorithm itself. The second uh, class of uh, difficulty is ill-conditioning. And here the typical approach is to have a second order approach, which basically changes the um, neighborhood metric. And the third uh, uh, difficulty was ruggedness or non-smoothness. And the approach to tackle non-smooth functions is basically to have a non-local search policy, to search with a step size as large as possible. And this is in particular possible with population-based approaches and also stochastic approaches and non-elitist approaches. Okay, we come to part two of our tutorial. How does CMAS work? We will give a general search template which embraces many, if not most, or all search algorithms. We will talk a little bit about the normal distribution, we will talk about step size adaptation and about covariance matrix adaptation. This is a generic search template which describes a stochastic search, but not only stochastic search. We assume we have a distribution parameter, theta, and a population size, lambda. And we have to initialize both parameters. Now, why not terminate? We first sample from the distribution P, given the parameter vector theta, and we sample lambda, new candidate solutions in the R to the N. Now we evaluate the solutions on the objective function f. Then we update the parameters theta based on the old parameter vector theta, based on the candidate solutions that we have sampled, and based on the f values of the candidate solutions. Now everything depends on how we define p, the distribution, so what kind of class of distribution we assume here and how we define the update of the parameters of the distribution. And if these distributions are direct distributions, then deterministic algorithms are covered as well. In many classical evolutionary algorithms, the distribution P is implicitly defined. We are operators on a population, like selection and recombination and mutation. And the template we see here is a natural template for so-called estimation of distribution algorithms. Now this is the CMAS algorithm and I just want to highlight here that under the while loop we have one line for sampling and then we have five additional lines for updating the distribution which was the third point on the previous slide. Now, before we discuss the update of the parameters, we first will talk about sampling and the distribution from which is a sample, try to understand how this distribution actually looks like. In evolution strategies, we sample new search points normally distributed. The candidate solution X is distributed as N plus sigma times a normal distribution with covariance matrix C. One way to look at this distribution is as a perturbation of M by a normal distribution with mean zero. We distinguish three parameters, the mean vector, which represents the favorite solution, the so-called step size, which controls the step length, and the covariance matrix C, which determines the shape of the distribution. And all points are sampled with the same parameters. Now the question remains how to update M, C and Sigma. As we saw in the previous slides, 
we use normal distributions to generate candidate solutions. The reasons that we prefer normal distributions over other distributions are as follows. First, it is widely observed in nature, as its characteristics are very well analyzed. Second, the normal distribution is the only stable distribution with finite variance. It means the distribution of a sum of uh, normally distributed random vectors is again a normal distribution. These characteristics of normal distributions are helpful in design and analyze the algorithms. The third reason is that it is the most convenient way to generate isotopic search points. The isotopic search distribution is preferred to not favor any direction and the resulting algorithm rotational invariant. Finally, it is the maximum entropy distribution with finite variance, which poses the least possible assumptions on f, the objective function, in the distribution shape. We will look at some characteristics of the normal distribution in a few slides. The probability density of the 1D standard normal distribution is displayed on the top left figure. It is symmetric around its mean, which is zero in this case, and the peak is also at the mean. In case of 2D normal distribution with identity covariance matrix, the uh, level set of the probability density are all isotropic, as we see on the bottom right figure. In general, Multivariate normal distribution on the n-dimensional space is uniquely determined by two parameters. The mean vector, denoted by m here, which is an n-dimensional vector, and the covariance matrix, denoted by c, which is a symmetric positive definite n times n-dimensional matrix. The mean vector determines the location of the distribution. Analogously to one and two dimensional cases, the mean vector is the location where the greatest density and the distribution is symmetric along the distribution mean. On the other hand, the covariant matrix determines the shape of the distribution. There is a one to one relation between the covariance matrix and the isodensity density ellipsoid of the normal distribution. Here we visualize the ice density ape source in three different situations. First, consider the case where the covariance matrix is proportional to the identity. In this situation, we have one degree of freedom which determines how widely the distribution spread. The ice density ellipsoid is isotropic in this situation. Second, consider the case where the covariance matrix is diagonal. In this situation, the ice density ellipsoid is not isotropic, but it is coordinate-wise uh, ellipsoid. We have n degrees of freedom, which determines the axis length of the ice density ellipsoid in each coordinate. Finally, consider the general cases where the covariance matrix is an arbitrary positive definite symmetric matrix. In this situation, the degree of freedom is n squared plus n over 2, and the ice density episode is not necessarily coordinate parallel anymore. To give a geometric interpretation of the covariance matrix, consider the eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix. Since the covariance matrix is symmetric positive definite, we can decompose it as the sum of the eigenvalue times the self after product of the corresponding eigenvectors. The square root of the case greatest eigenvalue corresponds to the case longest axis of the ice density ellipsoid, and the axis direction is determined by its corresponding eigenvectors. The last point 
to talk about normal distributions is the effect of dimensionality. The last figure shows the probability density of the norm of the normal distribution for dimension 1, 2, 5, 17, and 65. The bottom right figure is the same figure with log scale. As we can see in the figure on the left, as we increase the dimensionality, the distribution of the norm just shifts toward right. Indeed, it is known that for large n, the distribution of the norm of the n-dimensional normal random vector tends to the normal distribution with the mean of square root of n minus one half and the variance of one half. It indicates that the samples generated from the normal distribution are concentrated around surface of an ice density ellipsoid, and they are unlikely to be close to the distribution mean. It may be somewhat counterintuitive as the probability density has a peak at the mean. Okay, so now we have discussed the first step of our a template, the sampling of the distribution. For the second step, there is not much to say. We evaluate the sample solutions on F, and now we will discuss the update of the parameters theta, which contain the mean vector of the distribution, the step size, and the covariance matrix. To compute the new mean vector of the distribution, we take the weighted average of the new best points. The best solution get the highest weights and uh, the weights sum to 1 and are all positive. Then the quantity 1 over the sum of the squared weights is meaningful in, in the sense that it computes some kind of effective parent population size to compute the mean. Now we can also write this update as a change of the mean vector and we add sigma times by w to the mean vector and by w is the mean shift or the change of the mean which we will also use uh, in the following. And before we uh, discuss the more sophisticated updates of the steps as sigma and the covariance matrix C, I want to talk a little bit about invariance properties which are kind of important uh, when designing these kind of updates. Now the update we have just seen and all other updates of the CMAS algorithms only depend on the ranking of the solutions, on the F ranking of the solutions. And that implies an important invariance property, which is invariance under monotonically increasing transformation of the function values. On this slide we see th three functions on which the algorithm behaves exactly identically. On the left we see the function f of x equals x squared, arguably the most simple function uh, one can optimize in continuous domain. And most evolution strategies optimize the left function exactly as fast as the middle function or the right function. Or in other words, the middle or the right function exactly as fast as arguably the simplest function to be optimized. Now the key feature of invariance is not that we are fast on the right function or fast on the left function. The key feature is that by doing simple experiments on the left function, we can predict with mathematical precision the performance on a large class of functions which includes the right functions. Now CMA has several other invariance properties and I just want to mention one invariance property here. That is translation invariance, which is true for most optimization algorithms. Translation invariance means that shifting the search space and shifting the initial point or changing the initial point is actually equivalent. That means up to changing the initial point respectively, the algorithm is invariant to translations of the search space. So this invariance is in a sense qualitatively different to invariance to monotonic transformations because it depends on the initial state which has to be changed accordingly to be mathematically invariant. 
Now to summarize, we have seen an algorithm which updates the mean vector of the distribution and is invariant to translations and monotonous transformations of the f value uh, of the objective function. Now here we see a simulation of this algorithm uh, in the blue graph. We see on the x-axis the number of function relations, as usually, and on the y-axis we see the best f value in the current iteration, plotted in log scale, on the 20-dimensional so-called sphere function. Again, the simplest function we can optimize in continuous domain. We can see that the algorithm only works up to a certain point and then stagnates. And what comes next is how to address this stagnation. We just quickly recall the sampling distribution, which depends on the mean vector, a step size sigma, and a coherence matrix C. And now we will talk about ways to update the step size sigma. There are three classical methods to update the step size sigma in evolution strategies, and we will later also see a fourth method, which we often use in CMA, but not the most common one. The first rule here is the one fifth success rule, which is usually not applied with CMA, but which has an interesting conceptual idea that we should sample with the step size such that 20% of the offspring of the new candidate solutions are better than the current favorite candidate solution. That is, it is optimal kind of to throw away 80% of the sample candidates we actually sample which is in a very surprising optimality condition. The second method is self-adaptation, which interprets the step size as parameter of the genome, which is also mutated and selected according to similar rules um, we have seen before for the X vector. It's a classical method, but I would say it's superseded by other methods, which work just usually better, in particular on population-based algorithms. And the third method we see here is path length control, which we will discuss now in more detail. We explain the concept of the cumulative step size adaptation mechanism, which is the default step size adaptation in the CMAES. The main idea is to measure the length of the so-called evolution path. Often speaking, the evolution path is the moving average of the movement of the mean vector. In CSA, we consider that the movement of the main mean vectors are perpendicular in the desired distribution because it is not efficient to move back and forth or to move in one direction. Based on the observation that the mean vector movements are perpendicular under random selection, we consider the expected length of the evolution path under the random section as the baseline. If the evolution path is shorter, it is a sign of move, moving back and forth, and hence we decrease the step size. And if the evolution path is longer, it is a sign of moving in one direction, and hence we increase the step size. Next, we look at the equations. We consider mu comma lambda ES with CSA, which is sometimes called CSA ES. We first initialize the mean vector and the step size. Set the evolution path to zero. For CSA, we have two hyperparameters. One is C sigma, it is the accumulation factor that determines how long we care about the past. It is usually set to proportional to 1 over n. The other one is d sigma. It is a damping parameter introduced to prevent a big change of the step size when the population size is large. It is set to nearly 1 for our default population size setting. The mean vector is updated as we have already seen before. The evolution path accumulates the mean vector movement normalized by the current sigma. Here 
square root of mu w is introduced to account for the effect of the weighted recommendation. In this way, we can show that the evolution path follows the normal distribution under the random selection. Hence, the expectation of the norm of the evolution path can be derived analytically. Remember that we consider this expectation as the baseline. We increase the step size if the evolution path is longer and decrease the step size if it is shorter using the equation at the bottom. This figure compares the CSAES and the ES with the optimal step size. This is the result on the sphere function. Vertical axis is the distance between the current mean and the optimal, which are displayed in blue for CSA and red for the optimal step size case. And the corresponding black line, black graph, are the step size values. On the sphere function, it is known that the optimal step size is proportional to the distance between the current mean vector and the optimal. Now look at the blue graph and the corresponding black graph. In this situation, we have set the initial step size smaller than its optimal value. Therefore, at the beginning, we observed the increase of the step size while the mean vector was approaching the optimum very slowly. Once the step size was reached to its right value, then the distance to the optimum as well as the step size started decreasing at the same constant rate. Compared to the optimum step size situation, we use only the factor of around 2 in the speed of convergence. In other words, we cannot expect a step size adaptation better than CSA by the factor more than two, at least in this situation. It partly shows the goodness of the CSA, but of course, there are other choices which may be better for other situations. In the next slides, Nico will present an alternative step size adaptation mechanism. Now we want to present another attractive way to adapt the step size, which is called two-point step size adaptation. The idea of two-point step size adaptation is that of a very rudimentary line search. The line search goes in the direction of the previous mean shift, and it consists of two points. And the two points have the same distance to the current mean mg. Then we compare the ranking between the two points. And if the rank of the elongated step is better than the rank of the reversed step, we increase the step size. Two-point adaptation, TPA, is not the default step size adaptation mechanism in CMA, which is CSA, but it generally works pretty well. And it does fix some defect we have observed with CSA. The defect is shown in the lower left, where we run the algorithm on a function with low effective dimensionality. That means the function itself has a high dimension, but only a few dimensions actually affect the function value. In this case, CSA works comparatively poorly, as you can see on the lower left. And this is due to noisy information from the ineffective dimensions. It performs even worse than what we expect from the problem defined on the full dimensional uh, search space. TPA, on the other hand, performs almost as good as it would have been run on the lower dimensional subspace problem only, as we can see on the lower right figure. And finally, there are two success-based step size control mechanisms, the median success rule and the population success rule. These are somewhat cheaper to compute than CSA and TPA, and don't rely on the knowledge of uh, the inverse of C. Here we see a simulation of uh, the evolution strategy with step size adaptation on a very simple function, the sphere function, sum of xi squared, and a 
derivation of the shear function where half of the variables are scaled by a different factor than one. And we see simulations with um, four different factors, one, which is a shear function, three, 10, and 30. And the condition number of the problem is the factor squared. When we increase the factor from one to three, we see a performance loss about of a factor of two. And when we increase the factor from three to 10, we see a much bigger performance loss of about a factor of eight. And for any further increase, we see about a performance loss of the increase squared. Now with a condition number of up to 900, these are not particularly ill-conditioned problems. And this suggests that step size adaptation alone is not sufficient to solve difficult problems in practice. And this is indeed what is covariance matrix adaptation is for. Here we see simulations with covariance matrix adaptation on the very same functions. Now the performance loss for the most difficult function is here about the factor of five, whereas before it was a factor of somewhat above 100. Okay, we quickly recall the sampling equations for evolution strategies. We have talked about the update of the mean vector, we have talked about the update of the step size, and now we will talk about the update of the covariance matrix, which determines the shape of the distribution. We visually introduce the basic concept of the covariance matrix adaptation. Suppose we have the identity covariance matrix and the circle is the ice density ellipsoid of the normal distribution. We sample lambda candidate solutions from the current distribution and evaluate them on the objective function. We select new best candidates in using these new best candidate solutions, we update the mean vector. Here, YW denotes the movement of the mean vector, and we ignore the step size adaptation for simplicity here. We update the covariance matrix by taking the mixture of the current covariance matrix and the self outer product of the step YW. This leads to the normal distribution longer in the direction of the mean vector movement than the other direction. This will increase the chance to produce the movement in the same direction again. The ice density ellipsoid of the new distribution is displayed in blue. We repeat the same steps. We sample lambda candidate solutions from the current the new distribution and evaluate them on the objective function. We update the mean vector by taking the weighted sum of the best new candidate solutions and compute the mean vector movement. We update the covariance matrix by taking the mixture of the current covariance matrix and the self outer product of the mean vector movement. Then we obtain the next distribution. By adapting the covariance matrix in this way, we expect to increase the likelihood of the successful steps YW to appear again. From another viewpoint, this adaptation mechanism follows an approximated natural gradient of the expected fitness. Next, we look at the equations. Here we omit the step size adaptation for simplicity. The covariance matrix is typically initialized to the identity matrix unless a prior knowledge is available. We introduce a hyperparameter, which is denoted by C cob, which is the learning rate for the covariance matrix adaptation. It is set to proportional to 1 over n square, which is the reciprocal of the degrees of freedom of the covariance matrix. Since the covariance matrix adaptation is introduced, the candidate solutions are generated using the normal distribution with non-identity covariance matrix. The mean vector is updated by the weighted recombination as we saw before, 
the covariance matrix is updated by the weighted sum of the current covariance matrix and the self other product of the of the um, mean vector movement. Here we introduce mu w to account for the effect of the weighted recombination and normalize the second term to be competitive to the first term. We provide different interpretations of the covariance matrix adaptation. First, it learns all pairwise dependencies between variables. The often diagonal entries of the covariance matrix reflect the dependencies between variables. It can also be considered as conducting a principal component analysis sequentially in time and space. It learns a new rotated problem representation. As we saw in the slides of normal distribution, the axes of the ice density ellipsoid of the normal distribution are given by the eigenvectors, which are also known to each other. Then the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix can be regarded as the new coordinate representation. It learns a new Maharabis metric, but also it approximates the inverse Hessian if the objective function is a quadratic function. So the covariance matrix adaptation implicitly exploit the second order information of the objective function without using the local information of the objective function, such as the gradient. Therefore, the covariance matrix adaptation is a key to tackle the conditioning and the non-separability of the problems. And as we mentioned in the previous slide, it can be seen as the natural gradient ascent on the expected fitness landscape. Now we mention the relation between the invariance of the CMADS and the covariance matrix adaptation. One of the key concepts in the design of the CMADS is the invariance and the such space transformation. Roughly speaking, invariance under the side space transformation refers to the property of the algorithm that behaves identically in one coordinate system and in its transformed coordinate system. As we discussed before, separable problems can be transformed into non separable problems by just rotating the side space coordinate. The left figure is the Rastigin function, and the right figure is the separable fun uh, episode function. They are both separable problems. If we rotate the side space by the rotation matrix R, then these functions become non-separable problems. So if algorithm exploit the separability, then the previous functions can be easily solved, but these rotated functions cannot be solved efficiently. However, for such algorithms with rotational invariance, these problems are identical. Therefore, non-separable problems can be as easily as easy solved as separable problems. It is the key to the success of the CMAES on non-separable problems, and this invariance is achieved by introducing the covariance matrix of full degree of freedom. We have seen before that we have used cumulation or the evolution path and the length of the path to adapt the step size pretty successfully. It turns out that this concept of cumulation or the evolution path is also useful for updating the covariance matrix. Just a reminder, the evolution path is a search path the strategy takes over a number of generation steps. It's basically a sum of consecutive steps. For practical purposes, we use an exponentially weighted sum, and this can be constructed iteratively in each iteration step. Now, this concept of cumulation is actually a quite widely known technique, um, referred to as exponential smoothing in time series and forecasting, ex as exponential weighting moving average, as iterate averaging and stochastic approximation, 
as the momentum in backpropagation for artificial neural networks. Um, one aspect of it is that it um, implements a low-pass filtering, but that's not the most important, at least in our context. Now, the most important aspect of accumulation we can see when we look at the coherence matrix update from a vector. The update reads y times y transpose here for the vector y. And it turns out that if we take minus y times minus y transposed, we get the exact same result. That means by doing this update, we lose the sign information on y. But if we take the sum of both vectors, this sum depends heavily on the sign of the second vector. That means by taking the sum of the two vectors instead of single vectors, we can recover information, the sign information we had lost in the update previously. The information is basically the correlation between steps. This information was useful to adapt the step size, but this information is also useful to adapt the current matrix. And indeed what we do with the rank 1 update is instead of taking the mean shift in the update of the current matrix, we take an evolution path in the update of the current matrix. And this information gain can have surprisingly great effects on the performance, as we will see on the next slide. Here we see data run the CMAS on the so-called SIGA function with and without accumulation, with different uh, accumulation coefficients. Displayed is the number of function relations to reach a certain target value versus the dimension and the evaluations are divided by dimension. For accumulation factor 1 over square root n or 1 over n, the graphs are flat. That means the number of evaluations scale linear with dimension. And without accumulation, the graph scales, well, not exactly quadratically, but close to quadratically with dimension, at least definitely not linear with dimension. So by this kind of very simple trick, we can reduce the number of function relations from almost n square to n. That's kind of a surprising result because we built a current matrix still which has n square uh, number of uh, degrees of freedom, but we can learn important aspects of this model already in time n. One way to interpret uh, this result is that the evolution path modulates the learning rate on the current matrix in certain directions. Because the evolution path becomes large, implicitly that means we increase the learning rate. We presented the concept of accumulation. This is one direction to accelerate the covariance matrix adaptation by accumulating the past information. Now we talk about the other direction of accelerating the covariance matrix adaptation, which is called rank mu update. The Lankme update extends the update rule for large population size using more than one vectors to update the covariance matrix at each iteration. In Lankme update, we compute the weighted empirical covariance matrix of the best new candidate solutions. This matrix is of rank minimum of mu and n with probability 1, which is the reason why we call it Lankme update. Here, the weights can be negative, and indeed, we set negative values in the advanced update mechanisms. But for now, let's assume they are all positive. Then, the rank mu update takes simply the linear combination of the current covariance matrix and the weighted covariance, empirical covariance matrix. Importantly, we set the learning rate to be proportional to mu w divided by n squared, which is basically proportional to the population size in the standard setting of the weights. This slide visualizes the rank mu update. Suppose that we have the normal distribution with the identity covariance matrix. We sample lambda candidate solutions. Here, lambda is set to 150. We select the best mu candidate solutions and compute the steps which are the differences from the current mean to the selected candidate solutions. 
the steps are visualized by the thin block line in the picture. We compute the empirical covariance matrix of the steps, then we obtain the next distribution. Now we talk about the differences between the CMAES and similar approaches. We can find similar approaches in estimation of distribution algorithms. One example is EMNA Global. The only difference in the update of the covariance matrix is that the Langmuir update, Langmuir covariance matrix ad adaptation conducts a PCA of steps, which are the difference from the current mean vector to the selected candidate solution. Whereas EMNA Global conducts a PCA of the selected points. Therefore, log mu CMA increase, try to increase the variance in the successful steps, whereas EMNA Global does the opposite. Therefore, even though the difference is minimum in equation, the behavior can be rather different. We summarize the rank mu update and the rank one update in this accumulation. The goodness of the rank mu update is that we can increase the learning rate when the population size is large. Basically, we can set it proportional to the population size. Because of the greater possible learning rate, we can reduce the number of necessary iterations to adapt the covariance matrix roughly from order of n squared to n if the population size is set proportional to n. Therefore, the rank mu update is a primary covariance matrix adaptation mechanism when a large population size is used. On the other hand, the rank 1 update can use information from the past by using the evolution task. It contributes to reduce the number of necessary function variations to learn straight leads from the order of n square to n. These two update rules have different effects in accelerating the adaptation of the covariance matrix, and we can easily combine them and take advantage of their goodness. So here we look again at simulations on the two-axis function. It's a convex quadratic function where half of the axis have a scaling factor of 1 and the other half of the axis have a scaling factor of 10 to the 3. So they are 1000 times more sensitive than the other axis. In the subplots we see on the upper left the best function value and on the lower right we see the principal axis length of the mutation ellipsoid. The axis length we expect to become 1 and 1000 times some factor as in the function definition. And indeed that's what we can observe in the end. Half of the axis length are 1000 times larger than the other half. Now on the upper left we see the CMAs run only with the rank 1 update and it takes about 12,000 function iterations um, to solve the problem. On the lower left, we see the algorithm run only with the rank, rank mu update, and we see that it takes about 15,000 evaluations to solve the problem. Now, if you combine the two updates, as on the upper right, um, the time is even smaller, like 9,000 evaluations to solve the problem. That is not only we can combine these two updates uh, smoothly, but also it gains uh, some uh, speed in terms of adaptation of the coins matrix. Now on the next slide we see the actually most important aspect of the rank new update. We see the same simulations but with population size lambda equals 50 instead of 10. These are simulations in 10D. And what we see now, the rank 1 update alone takes roughly 40,000 function iterations. So by increasing the population size by a factor of 5, we become about three times slower. However, the rank mu update takes still about 12,000 function iterations, so we don't see much of a difference here. And it seems that this update exploits the information from the entire population better than the rank 1 update, which is not a surprise.
Now if we combine rank band and rank mu update with population size 50, we see basically the same performance as with rank run update, which is again good news because that was the much better performance in this case. So far we have seen simulations on the sphere function, sum of xi is square, and on the two axis functions where half of the axis had a much larger scaling factor. Now we want to make a point that there are different uh, types of ill conditioning and here are one pronounced ones apart from the two axis function. On the left we see the sigur type function. We actually also have seen already a result for the rank one update on the sigur function. On the right we see kind of the inverse type, the discus type ill conditioning, where one axis or a small number of axes have a very high factor, here alpha, and the others have a low factor or one. One could think of um, of this function as some kind of soft constraint function in one uh, or a few axes. Uh, the behavior on these two type of functions of algorithms can be kind of quite different. This SIGA type of function is difficult for many algorithms, not so much for CMA as with cumulation. And the discus type of function is not so difficult, but CMA tends to scale worse on this function than on the SIGA type of function. So now we present an improvement of CMAES on discourse type ill-conditioned functions. The active update of the covariance matrix is sort of a negative update. That means it reduces the variance in certain directions in the covariance matrix. Of course, what we want is we want to reduce the variance in directions where we see bad solutions. That is, we decrease the variances in unpromising directions. And the ultimate update of the current matrix combines all three types of updates. The rank 1 update with the evolution path, the rank mu update, and the active update which reduces variance in promising directions. In all remaining directions where we didn't sample any offspring, the variance is unchanged. Now we see the effect of active CMA of the negative update on the discus function in 10D. On the left we see only the positive update and it takes 8000 functional relations to solve the problem and on the right we see that it takes about half the time to solve the problem if we introduce the active CMA. Now I want to mention one caveat here is that an update with negative weights can break positive definiteness uh, of the coherence matrix. There are ways to deal with that problem, but as an algorithm designer, you have to be aware of it. Okay, let's do a summary of the Coins Matrix update. We have seen the rank 1 update, which uses cumulation or the evolution path. And we have seen the rank mu update, which uses the whole population or half of the population, the better half of the population. And then we have seen the active uh, update which uses the worst half population to reduce the variance in the respective directions. The components somehow complement each other. So accumulation excels when we need to learn one long axis. The rank mu update is sufficient if we have a large population size. And the active update is effective when we have to learn a short axis. And on the other hand, they don't really interfere with each other. And as already mentioned, positive definiteness is a problem with the active update, which is solvable. This slide summarizes what we have explained so far. Basically, what we have been explaining in this tutorial is uh, summarized only in six equations. At each iteration, we sample lambda candidate solutions from the multivariate normal distribution. The mean vector is updated by weighted recombination. Two evolution passes are updated, one for CSA and one for the Lampwang CMA. Note that we introduced the square root of the inverse of the covariance matrix in the evolution pass for CSA to account for the change in the covariance matrix. The step size is updated using the length of the evolution path 
and the covariance matrix is updated by using the rank one update and rank new active update. That's all what we need to know to understand the concept of the same yes and we finalize the second part of the tutorial. The last topic of the tutorial is what can and should the users do for the same yes to work effectively on their own problems. We have introduced a number of hyperparameters listed here. The number of candidate solutions, also called the population size, the number of parents, the combination weights, accumulation factor for the rank 1 update, running rate parameters for rank 1 update and rank new update, accumulation factor for CSA, and the dumping parameters. However, their default values are carefully designed based on experiment as a function of the dimension, and they don't need to be tuned depending on the objective function in the first place. On the other hand, the following should be set or implemented depending on the problem. Related to initial search distribution, the initial mean vector and initial step size and possibly the initial covariance matrix should be set depending on the problem. If we have an initial guess of a good solution, it is recommended to set the initial mean vector to such an initial guess and set the initial step size relatively small. This way, we can expect to locally improve the initial guess. Then, increase the step size, for example, by the factor of 10 to globally uh, search for a better solution. The other point that should be implemented depending on the, point, the problem is the stopping conditions. For example, the number of function variations, the maximum iterations, function value tutorials, minimum access length, and stagnation check. Their values should be chosen carefully, especially when you plan to employ a restart strategy. In the lab tutorial, we will give a demonstration of running the CMAES on test programs. CMAES have been implemented in different programming languages. Here we use PyCMA. It is a Python implementation of the CMAES, mainly maintained by Nico. If you are familiar with Python, it is very easy to start using PyCMA. In your system shell, you can type the one line displayed at the bottom of the slide. Then, PyCMA will be installed. This is a sample script of optimizing a very known Rosenberg function. The first line import CMA module. The second line create a CMA options instance. It contains hyperparameters, termination conditions, and so on. In the third line, we set the target function value to 1 to the power of minus 4. And in the fourth line, uh, we set the maximum number of function variations to 10 to the power of 6. The main function is fmin in line 5. It takes the objective function as the first argument. Here we optimize the Rosenberg function. The keyword argument x0 and sigma0 are the initial mean vector and initial step size. The CMA options instance is given to the keyword argument options. Then fmin function minimizes the given objective function and print out some information such as the number of iterations, the number of function variations, and the obtained function values, and so on. After the call of fmin function, we can call plot function, and we get figures like this. You can see how the CMAES behaves on this function. 
One important reason why we use evolutionary computation methods over classical optimization methods is that functions can be multimodal or highly multimodal. And we believe there are a few aspects in evolutionary computation which can help to overcome these kind of problems which pose these functions. From the practical perspective, we want to discuss two ways to approach multimodal functions. And they are kind of directly connected to two meta-parameters, if you like. One is the population size and the other is the initial step size, which is somehow also related to the initial mean vector of the distribution or the initial candidate solution. Now let's start by the second, which is actually conceptually available for basically any optimization algorithm. That is, we do just restarts and we randomize the restarts in some way that they are likely to be different in the outcome. And this randomization means in particular that we need to have a small step size because if you choose a large step size in the beginning, you are more likely to have a similar outcome or an outcome which is less dependent on the initial solution. The second approach is to increase the population size or try um, to solve the optimization problem with a larger population size. A practical way to do this is to do restarts with increasing population size with the idea that starting with a small population size is comparatively cheap uh, compared with using a larger population size. Now a large population size is effective if we have somehow a global structure we cannot capture otherwise. Test function wise this is uh, for example the case for the Schaffer function or the Rastrigan function. Here we see empirical records of the success probability depending on the population size on two different functions, left the Rastrigan, right the Krugan function, and for different dimensionality of the search problem. We see that on these two functions, generally the success probability goes up with increasing population size. And we sometimes even see something like a phase transition, kind of a minimal population size to solve, to have any chance to solve that problem at all. This is the typical kind of uh, function where evolutionary algorithms actually excel. Then we have a type of function where the only way to solve them is to get lucky by a restart. In this case, it is effective to do as many restarts as possible and to use a small initial step size and to randomize the initial solution. And a variation of this kind of problem is if we need to randomize the initial solution and to have a small step size, but still need a large population size to solve the problem locally. I'm actually not sure which type of function the Schwefel problem which is depicted here is. There are two classical restart strategies for CMAs called IPOP and BIPOP. The IPOP regime is restarting with increasing population size, otherwise the restarts are randomized and independent. But we also have some indication that it might be useful to do this with a variation of initial sigma as well. The second scheme is the BIPOP scheme, which combines the IPOP scheme with a regime of uh, many local restarts with a small population size. There's a budget allocation involved that both regimes, the IPOP regime and the local search regime, get about the same amount of budget. The idea is to capture like this all kind of multimodality or most kind of multimodality or several kinds of multimodality to solve the function. The last topic is restricted covariance matrix adaptation. One of the bottlenecks of the CMA years on high dimension problems is its n square time and space complexities. They are required to simply store and update the covariance matrix, but also it to compute uh, the decomposition of the covariance matrix to sample candidate solutions. Another bottleneck is the learning rate for C update, which are a proportion to 1 over n square meaning that it takes more iterations to adapt the covariance matrix as n becomes larger. One way to avoid these bottlenecks is to exploit the player knowledge on the problem structure, such as separability. 
by exploiting the problem structure, we may be able to decrease the degree of freedom of the covariance matrix, which will lead to less time and space complexity and higher learning rates. There are different variants of the same ideas for high dimensional optimization with different classes of restricted covariance matrices. Sub-CMA yes, use the diagonal covariance matrix. VDCMA also consider the diagonal element plus one vector to represent a limited class of variable dependency. LMCMA yes, on the other hand, do not consider the diagonal elements. Instead, it introduces K vectors to represent more variable dependencies. BDC, uh, VKDCMA also use K vectors as well as uh, diagonal elements. Here we focus on the SEPCMAES. We explain the difference between the standard CMA and the SEP CMA. As we explained like an hour ago, Limiting the covariance matrix to be diagonal results in limiting the ice density episode of the normal distribution to be coordinate parallel. To sample a candidate solution, usually we need to compute the square root of the covariance matrix, which is computationally expensive if C has the few degrees of freedom. However, if the covariance matrix is diagonal, then its square root can be easily computed. Therefore, we can save the computational time. The update of the co diagonal covariance matrix can also be done with time complexity linear in dimension. Since we have only n degrees of freedom in diagonal matrices, rather than n square of the full covariance matrix, we can set n times greater learning rates for the covariance matrix update, which leads to the speed up also in the adaptation time. These figures show the optimization result of the SEP CMA on the left and the CMA on the right on 100 dimensional separable ellipsoid function. The standard CMA spends 10 times more function versions as it takes more time to adapt the covariance matrix and it spends more CPU time than the SEP CMA. It shows the goodness of the SEP CMA, yes. However, there is a defect. Since the SEP CMAES limit the covariance matrix to be diagonal, it loses the rot rotational invariance. Its performance is deteriorated on some non separable and ill conditioned problems, for example, the rotated ellipsoid functions. 